It's happening. Adults across the country can buy cannabis. People have a lot of questions, so I invite some friends over to talk about it. Joining me today is Alexandra Perry from Addiction Rehab. The conversation we're having right now, I think, is very idealistic. Lachlan Chang, a cultivation consultant. We're basically conducting a large-scale pharmacological intervention on society. And Tyler James from Eden Medicinal Society. There's relevance to it being an exit drug. I'm Chuck Rafici, and we're talking to this. We grew up hearing that cannabis is a gateway drug. Is it true that cannabis leads to harder drug use? Oh, looking at me, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be polite. Um, from a biopsychosocial assessment, looking at all the way back to the first use, not first use of their drug of choice, but first use of a substance, I would say nine out of 10 of the clients that I work with say cannabis is their first experience. Even over alcohol? Even over alcohol. Yeah, I'd have to say even before I tried alcohol, I smoked weed, so I'm not going to discount it, so I would say that, yeah, I could see why uh, it could be proven to be a gateway, but I do think there's a lot of relevance to it being an exit drug as well for people trying to get off of other narcotics, not just, op not just opiates, um, but there were individuals even in, in our program who you know, had addictions to cocaine that, you know, to get off of those cravings and to distance themselves from those feelings, they were using things like rosins and shatters and smoking those um, to get a similar kind of euphoric feeling and, you know, get their dopamine levels up uh, without having to go to such lengths to get such an illicit product. I have a very hard time sort of with the use of the term gateway drug in any sort of element. I just feel like a, it implies a causative nature to it. I think that the idea that trying to assign the origin of addiction to a single point, um, even if it is an explicit trauma, which may be a causative factor, I think we just don't have the capacity to be able to trace it back to single events. So I, I think it's not a meaningless statement, but I feel like it's not a useful statement in terms of advancing forward what we're looking to go for. Uh, you know, people are saying, I mean, uh, I mean, the Reagan administration, the U.S. drug war was very clear that cannabis use leads to cocaine and heroin and, and, many, and many other drugs. It is a gateway drug, literally. And we now see, you know, in, the, in, in Senate discussions when we were discussing legalization, there are, there are people representing Canadians that still believe that. I mean, can we categorically say that it is not a gateway drug? Well, I think co-distribution is a big element there. I, I think the fact that if you've got your weed dealer who also then says, well, wait, economics dictates I can make an extra 50 bucks if I sell you some coke. It's just a very difficult issue to sort of aggregate like that. So I, I think if you were to discuss it in a rational manner and say, in a given world, if you were given a selection of X, Y, or Z, if you were to start with any one of those, would it have a greater tendency to lead to other elements? I don't know if we could make it a distinction reasonably between alcohol, cigarettes, and tobacco, or, uh, and marijuana. I, I just don't know. I can't help but think of the word accessibility. If, again, we're talking about a 16-year-old kid at school who's being bullied and having anxiety, and we have to live up to all of these pressures these days, and it's just feeling so overwhelmed, and the only accessible way to help alleviate some of those emotions is going with their friends and smoking a little bit of weed rather than a more open conversation and discussion consistently within our community to offer the support for those individuals. So I think that that's sort of where the danger for me lies, that we're gateway or not, um, we need to improve our, the, the accessibility for the supports. And so, I mean, if I were to kind of put words in your mouth, Do it. by by legalizing the product, which mm -hmm. controls it, makes it harder for kids to access it, mm -hmm. legalization makes it less of a gateway. Yes, um, fair. Um, I think so long as, again, it's in combination with easier accessibility to other supports because we're still dealing with that individual who has those struggles, right? So they don't have that access anymore. What are we putting in place then? I've met a number of people in the industry, entrepreneurs, you know, people who are, have a very, uh, you know, they have a good quality of life, who, who use cannabis, uh, or heavy cannabis users, uh, who were previously alcoholics and have seen, have gone through that exit path and, and use cannabis to 
to stop drinking. And so I've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence of that. Um, I mean, do we, uh, you know, it, it, do you see that as well? Or is that, uh, for me, uh, that would point that it's a huge uh, off-ramp drug. Yeah, absolutely, and I've seen evidence in you know um, cannabis being used that way, and even other um, psychedelics, like even like ayahuasca being used. You know, there's there's even uh, I definitely think there is some credence to be given um, to the fact that cannabis can really help people who are looking at you know reducing their consumption of other um, you know alcohol, whether it be or other drugs as well. Um, and this isn't just you know anecdotal, but, but you know even myself, I. I you know, earlier on in, in, you know, university and stuff like that, I was more of a drinker because I was in London and that's what everybody was doing. You drink like a fish and it just got to the point where I didn't like, you know what I mean, waking up and wondering how I got in my bed. You know what I mean? Like those instances, you just don't, you don't get, and you don't get fond of those anymore, right? And I just found at that time that, you know, the consumption of cannabis is really giving me both the therapeutic and enjoyment that I needed and it allowed me to reduce that intake and, and at least for me, improve my standard of living. Well, and I think in that instance, I'd have to say that it's less of maybe an off-ramp in that case than there's a substitution. And I think substitution for use is, you know, harm reduction, totally valid. We've, you know, had throughout the course of the discussion, you know, the, you know, I'm not gonna get cirrhosis from my cannabis intake. The overall negative consequences are there, but I don't necessarily see it except in a very monitored and therapeutic sense to be an actual offer. I think if you're gonna be using those terminologies, you should be very careful because it's very easy for someone to say, well, I've got a drinking problem. I can just substitute it with something else. You know, let's say I can use a lot of cocaine. It keeps me up. I don't miss work. The negative effects are suddenly, but substituting mm -hmm. one substance for another is not necessarily, you know, always universally a positive or also a cure. Yeah, I guess I would, I would say that off ramp in some ways is, uh, you know, to reward it is, you know, is cannabis a, a better substitute or a more positive substitute for, for other, like other safer. Drugs. Yeah, and that's why I would say it's still considered the offer because for me, like, it's not that I, you know, consumed a lot of cannabis equivalent to what I was drinking. I actually reduced, like, was smoking less, but I just found that I had more, you know, time to do other things and I used and was more, cons I guess, cognizant of the amount of cannabis I was consuming to, you know, not just substitute it for alcohol, but to look at an evaluation of my life at that time and reduce the amount that I was drinking while replacing that with a consumption of cannabis that did not, or was not, I should say at the time, too abundant or too excessive just to kind of compensate for the alcohol that I was replacing it with. But I think that what you're discussing is that using a substitution from one substance to another allowed you to then sort of change the intention of your use because it went from the intention of use with drinking to, uh, you know, as you put it, forget where you went to bed and then having fun with your friends and the social pressures to suddenly your use of cannabis freeing you from what would have been, you know, the social stigma of the drinking, of not, not drinking to that level mm -hmm. and sort of the negative health consequences. So I do think it, it can be definitely healthy on an individual level. I just think that in discussing how to use it as an off-ramp or categorizing it that way, I think we should just be, especially with, again, it wasn't available at the time, but mm -hmm. being able to say that it's legal and that it is an option for the medical profession. I think if we're gonna look at it as a serious substitution, we should be looking at trying to incorporate the sort of best practices and medical evidence rather than simply saying, guys, we can swap one for the other and it worked for me being a way of carrying it forward. And that's oh. just on a personal case. And yeah. I like that point, Lachlan, that the discussion's really important that we were kind of speaking about. To what extent are, you know, doctors going to be looking at individuals and their history and the intent of use or whether it's and in that intention, whether it's an on-ramp or off-ramp or gateway or not gateway or harm reduction or not harm reduction or a holistic option for something like pain management. So the conversation we're having right now, I think is very idealistic, right? This would be great if we could all sit down. It's Bob Smith we're talking about, his file. This is what we're looking at. He's been 16. We're looking at his history. Awesome. We're going to give this as an option. But is that happening? And if that's not happening, then again, going back to those systemic issues, you know, in conjunction with this legalization, we have to make changes on that level as well. Well, and I think the long-term health effects of high-dose THC usage is actually still relatively unknown. I mean, not from the basis that we don't have examples of people who have been, 
consuming large volumes of THC for an incredibly long period of time, but we don't have large scale population studies that indicate it. We don't know what changing those balances work with. We do know that there are examples of testosterone decreases in the endocannabinoid system, that there are immunosuppression from uh, THC. These are all things that need to be examined and looked at. And I think to accurately say that long term, that we can have these safe things or that it is a good off ramp or substitute in those cases. I just think that current best practice, I think 100% we can accept it based anecdotally. And, but as we build, we need to make sure that we're looking and building studies that will follow these trends over time because mm -hmm. we're basically conducting a large scale pharmacological intervention on society and we should just take a look at it. Do you find it kind of ironic then that C45 is only addressing recreational cannabis and not some of these medicinal, you know, needs for study and research as well? I find the entire medical cannabis system incredibly frustrating in many levels. <laughs> C45 as it exists is maybe what's acceptable and we'll have to work with it, but in no ways I think any of us would defend it as ideal. Yeah. Legalization has to start somewhere. And yeah, better that it starts than not start at all, right? Yeah, it's a good first step. <laughs> <laughs> or it's at least it's a first step. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess good and bad, we'll have to wait and see. Thanks, Buds. That was a great conversation. It was a pleasure. Thanks for hosting, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck.